OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Hello, good morning. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Diana Vera Alba, and I'm going to present uh, OER 103, which is our third OER presentation in a series. Um, we had OER 101, where we went over OER basics, OER 102, where we went over a uh, deeper dive into Creative Commons licensing, and now an OER number three. Uh, a 103 advanced version, I'm going to focus on curating, uh, finding OER resources, and remixing those resources to fit you, yours and your institution's needs. So before we get started, a little bit about myself. I've been an online instructor and trainer since 2012. I've taught in the modalities of distance education, hybrid, high flex, and online ESL courses. I'm an OER and CAPE coordinator at my district at San Diego College of Continuing Education. I'm also a Canvas course designer, online faculty mentor, OER ZTC trainer, and an OTAN subject matter expert. So some of my hobbies include gardening and photography, and I'm a dog and pet and general enthusiast. So before we get started, I want to get uh, familiar on how comfortable you are with evaluating and adopting open educational resources. So if you could please vote in chat and type one, if you are not familiar with evaluating and adopting OERs, type two, if you are somewhat familiar, and type three, if you are very familiar. So this will give me the opportunity to paste this presentation for your needs, and um, that way I know how quickly or how slowly I can I can go. But of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me at any time. Um, I'm okay with that. Um, I'm here to answer your questions and, and help you out with um, evaluating and adopting OERs. Um, so today's agenda, um, again, the major um, part of this is evaluating and adopting open educational resources for you, your students, and your institution. We're going to look at the five steps uh, to adopt OER, creating and remixing OERs, and combining Creative Commons licenses. We'll have time for a break. And then we will go right into demoing and researching existing OERs, reviewing resources and modules in Canvas Commons. These are great opportunities uh, for you to have ready-made uh, materials that you can download into uh, your LMS, like Canvas Commons. Um, and then building an OER repository and referatory for your institution. Okay, so this is a great way for um, you to share out what you have found or store somewhere in your website, institution's website, or even an o, uh, a Canvas page. And I will show you my version of that uh, at the end. So we're going to start with the five steps to OER adoption. So after you've found some relevant OERs for your course and your student uh, course objectives and student learning outcomes, there are a few considerations for ensuring successful adoption of the open educational materials in your course. 
So you want to think about the evaluation and integration of the materials into your course content. And this is usually the responsibility of a faculty member, but other camp uh, campus stakeholders may be involved. Okay, so maybe a committee um, might look at this and how to integrate the, uh, the materials into courses. Um, maybe it's your director uh, or if you have a librarian or one of your resource instructors or a combination of all of those employees. So all campus employees who are involved in decision making and delivery of instructional materials to your students can and should support your adoption. Encouraging feedback from students on usability and access is also an important component, and I would probably emphasize that it is the most important component of making a successful transition to OER. Um, I'll give you some examples. Um, I have adopted several OERs into um, many of my courses, and sometimes um, I've thought that I've found it. I've found the greatest material. Um, this meets my course objectives. It's, it meets the student learning outcomes. But for some reason, it just doesn't. It it doesn't appeal to the students, or maybe it's the level is too high. And it's always always good to get feedback and immediate feedback from your students. So I've done this when I've adopted OER books. Um, I get, I, I'll lecture on the book, I have materials, slides, um, activities, and immediately that week I will um, survey my students and ask them what they liked about the materials, what they didn't like, and what was the most confusing to them. And I, I will adapt. So this is the beauty of open educational resources, that you can adapt the materials from how they are written. Okay, so we're going to look at how to do that. So a note about the five steps, um, steps one through three involve evaluation of OER, including a decision of whether to modify or not, and how to attribute the modified materials. Okay, so that's the, you could say the meat and potatoes of it. And then steps four and five involve processes and policies at your institution, right? So every institution has their policies and the way that they want um, their um, students' learning materials to be distributed. Um, so you, you want to kind of take a look at that, and, and we'll go over that uh, once we get to those steps. So step one is probably our more, most in-depth step, and that's reviewing the materials. So keep in mind that many open textbook materials that appear in OER repositories, such as OER Commons or Merlot, have been vetted and peer reviewed by faculty or subject matter experts. So may, you may use these reviews to narrow down your choices before examining them yourself. If you want to evaluate the materials further yourself, or maybe it's a requirement of your institution, there are some existing rubrics that can guide you and some checklists. So I'm going to go over some of those um, with you. So BC Campus Open Textbook Project has established an open uh, education resource reposit repository rubric that is used by faculty who provide peer reviews for its open textbooks. So in this project, BC Campus um, used this rubric as their faculty were writing new OERs, but you can certainly use it for materials that you find um, and see if these this rubric meets the standards of your institution. Um, open Oregon Ed Educational Resources developed three checklists, each designed for a specific user type to evaluate individual course materials, such as open textbooks. So I really liked these checklists, even though they're lengthy. Um, I didn't use every single question when I evaluate when I had my students evaluate the materials, but it gave me some ideas that I hadn't even thought about. I had my my ideas of 
what questions I would ask students about the materials I was presenting to them, but this checklist went in more into depth. So um, I really appreciated that. Um, so let's take a look at um, first the BC Open Campus textbook uh, rubric. And give that a second. So it's a six page, I believe, PDF. And, um, you know, there's information at the beginning on um, the areas that the rubric covers. So authority, audience, access, and diversity, really important. User friendliness, very important for your students. Um, the subject coverage, search functionality and browsing, the type of media, really important. If it's, is it a PDF? Is it a physical book? Is it a digital book or digital materials? And then the licensing and permissions. Okay, so all of those are covered in the rubric. There's some definitions here on online storage systems. Um, and then there's, they go into detail about the levels. So they have three levels. The first one is authority. So the rubric focuses on credentials, reputation, and association of the author or institution. Um, and then there's the uh, third level, which is the top level. Okay. The second level, and then the first level and the criterion for each of those levels. Okay. The same for the audience, there are three levels, and this focuses on the collection of people based on age, experience, or expertise for which the content was developed or curated, okay? So you want to make sure that the material matches the level of your students. Um, so there are a lot of, I, I work for a um, community college, but I am on the continuing education side, which is similar to adult education. Um, in fact, it's probably the same as a, a, adult education. And so a lot of the materials that are out there that I like that I think, wow, this is a great resource. I do have to modify because the audience um, is typically um, community college. So I teach ESL and the community college levels for ESL or ESOL are slightly higher than the levels for continuing ed or um adult education. So I do have to modify and I have to keep this in mind as I'm looking at it. Um, there's still great materials, but um, I know that if I do find something written by a uh, credit college um, ESL instructor that I will likely have to modify, okay? And then the next uh, criterion is access and diversity. So this rubric focuses on the avail availability and the provisions of content for a variety of learning styles and capabilities. So this is really, really important, right? Title V um, says that we have to, um, every, every student in our class has to have the same access, okay? So you want to definitely look at that <clears throat> as you are <clears throat> excuse me, as you are de either developing or looking for um, materials. Again, these are open educational resources, so likely you will be able to modify if some of these items are not on a resource that you like or that you found. <clears throat> User friendliness, so this part of the rubric focuses on the barriers to accessing and using the OER content. Another really important, can my, can my students access these materials? Where will they be? Will they be able to pick up a copy at the front desk or the bookstore if you have a bookstore? Or will these materials, digital materials, be posted to um, an LMS like Google Classroom or Schoolology or Canvas, right? Um, so you want to take a look at that. That's really important. Student access. And then subject coverage. So this rubric focuses on the depth of coverage of the subject area. Again, the three levels are there. <clears throat> then there's search functionality and browsing. So this rubric focuses on the search functionality 
advanced basic truncation of the OER to help users find exactly what they need without having to spend too much time browsing. So this is really, really important for us as educators, right? It's very easy for us to go down that rabbit hole of search, search, search. I know I do it all the time, but I am the OER coordinator, so it's kind of part of my job, um, but I'd probably do it anyways. So, um, so you want to look at this, especially if you have a team that you're going to be working with, you want uh, them to work smarter, not harder, right? So um, this, um, this part of the rubric is effective for that, measuring that. And then media type, the rubric focuses on the types of media. Is this video, audio, textual, visual, or maybe a combination? Um, so there's a right way to rate that. And then the last but not least, licensing and permission. Okay, so are you able to adapt, right? Is it a uh, one of the least restrictive Creative Commons licenses or is it one of the most restrictive Creative Commons licenses where you, you can use but you cannot adapt? Okay, so that's really important. I know when I'm looking for things, it's really important for me, again, I work on the continuing ed side so many times I find these great resources and I need something that's not very restrictive, right? So that I am able to modify and adapt the resource for my students. Okay, so any questions so far on this type of rubric? Okay, so this is just one example of a rubric. Um, and then we're going to look at the checklist. So there's faculty checklist for evaluating course materials, administrator checklist for evaluating, evaluating course materials, and student checklist for evaluating course materials. So let's look at the faculty checklist. A lot of these checklists have similar topics. Um, they are just geared towards um, those groups, faculty, administrator, or um, student, okay? Um, so similar to, you'll see some similarities to that rubric, right? This is a two-page checklist, um, but you'll see some similarities as far as um, what we are evaluating. So um, the flexibility of the material, again, is it a text? Is it a digital material? Um, does more than one format exist? Okay, so how flexible is the material? What is the cost? Right. So if it's an open educational resource, it's no cost to the students. However, that does not mean it's no cost to your institution. Right. Um, so sometimes um, there will be some minor duplicating costs if that is something that um, you would like your students to have is a physical copy of the materials. If you have a librarian or an OER coordinator like me or a teacher on special assignment that is um, putting all these materials together, right? There's a cost to that, right? Um, people's time. And then, um, the adoption, are you going to um, house this in an LMS? Do you have Canvas? Do you have access to um, Google Classroom or where are you housing it? So there's, you know, there's um, some fixed prices and then there's some um, ongoing prices. So you wanna consider the costs. But again, because they are open educational resources, these are free for students, just the cost uh, to keep in mind for your institution. Um, and then cultural re relevance, whose voice, viewpoints, perspectives, um, even images, right, in the resource. So you want to make sure that the resources um, are very inclusive as far as cultures. Um, and um, if they aren't, there's ways to change that, right? If um, the material is licensed, CC by um, least restrictive, I can remix, I can change some of the images, even some of the language, right, and those materials. Um, accessibility, um, the rubric talked about this as well, but is this material 
a, re a responsive design alternative to print. Okay, so um, is it adaptive? Does it have accessibility features? Will there be any delays for students access if um, they have a disability or if disability services has to request permission to adapt? Okay, so those are really important considerations. <clears throat> There's a link here. This is a great website, WCAG, and this is um, has many standards of for accessibility, especially web accessibility. So there's lots of information here on how to make your materials accessible, right? And what is required for materials to be accessible. Okay, lots of links in here. Um, so make sure you are aware of accessibility. And then data, privacy, and ethical business standards. Okay, so um, great, you have these materials, you found these great resources, they're open, um, but just because they're open resources, if they're licensed with a uh, Creative Commons license, that means that they are still copyrighted materials, copyrighted with permissions. So um, faculty have to, and instructors have to know that you still have to credit back, um, give credit to the publisher of the materials, okay? Um, also, does the publisher sell data to third party vendors? So if you're using somebody's website, you want to um, be aware of that, right? Um, and then contacting the publisher for your institution with ownership of your own data. Okay, that's also big, right? Um, does this website or do these digital materials gather your institution's data? So um, those are things to consider as well. And then integration with campus technology. Okay, so integration with your LMS. Um, at my institution, we use Canvas. Some instructors use a combination of Canvas and Google Sites. And, and so are these materials um, easily integrated into those learning management systems? Okay, so there's some questions here uh, for the checklist. And then lastly, is there customer support? So will the vendor provide free training to faculty and support staff? So that would be like software. Um, is the, um, also is the author accessible to, to you? Um, I've found that um, when I find resources, I'll check right away, you know, like the inside cover of a book or the outside, who is the author? If I really like the resource, I'll contact the author and let them know I'll probably use their resource and if they have any other resources and you'll be surprised that how willing um, authors are, are to sharing, especially authors of open educational resources. So I found this great textbook for my um, online ESL reading class. I contacted the author and the author gave me uh, a link to his Google site that had like 30 other materials, including um, pre-made Quizlet links to the books I was using and slides to the book I was using and a, and, you know, a teacher um, resource for the book I was using and other materials. So um, it's, it's nice that uh, for you to be able to uh, contact the instructor or I'm sorry, the author of that resource as well. Okay. All right. Any questions about using checklists or uh, rubrics? Again, if you find resources in OER Commons or Merlot, which, which are some of the larger repositories, most of the resources have been vetted, um, peer reviewed um, and uh, reviewed by users as well. Um, but your institution might require you to um, have a checklist or a rubric. Um, so it's good for you to have those resources. I don't see any questions, so I'll go ahead and continue. So we're still on step one. Um, there's an evaluation rubric here that's specific to um, from Achieve. 
They are a nonprofit organization dedicated to raising graduation rates and getting students college and career ready. So they've published an evaluation rubric for OER based on those their guidelines of graduating rates and college and career readiness. There um, are also accessibility of learning material specific rubrics for students with disabilities. So, um, you know, again, if you like that checklist, but you want to add a little bit more on accessibility or you want to add a portion of college and career readiness, since these materials are open resources, you can do that. And you can develop your own checklist or your own rubric based on all these materials. Um, you should always consult with your disability services office on campus or at your district whenever selecting instructional materials to ensure that the materials meet uh, these standards. And then the Community College Consortium of OER has published a blog series entitled Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Openness, right? So years past, we were talking about equity. Equity was um, the buzzword, right? But now it's expanded, right? We're looking at equity, diversion, inclusion, and openness. And that raises many points you will also want to keep in mind when evaluating resources. Okay, so now we're on step two, which is modifying the OER if necessary. And this is very likely, right? Um, sometimes it's personal preference. Um, maybe um, the materials that you found are in a book, but you want to create um, Canvas modules or or just only use um, certain portions of the book. If it's an OER that allows you to modify or remix, that's absolutely okay. Right. So we want to look at some tools and how to modify these resources. So after completing the evaluation using one of the checklists or rubrics um, that your uh, district may require, you can determine whether any modification is needed. So if you decide to modify uh, the materials, you may want to consider the format of the revised materials. So again, I use this great um, OER textbook, but I've also created Canvas modules and lessons and activities from this book. Um, so I knew I was gonna do a little extra work, um, but that was my choice. Um, Creative Commons license type. So you want to make sure that if you do want to modify the materials, that the that the license on those materials allow you to do that. And we're going to take a look at a chart with what you can and cannot do. Um, and then where the revised digital resource is going to be housed. So again, at my district, we use Canvas and that's where our uh, OER resources are housed. Um, I created a Canvas account for our faculty at our district, and I've shared it out to the Commons. So I'm going to share that with you um, later on in this presentation. And then again, um, we're still on step two, modifying the OER. Um, you want to think about formatting. So if the open material is available in an editable format, then the easiest approach may be to use that same tool, right? So I was fortunate. Um, and so this is for adding, deleting, and modifying. I was fortunate with the resource that I found. It was in it was on in Google Docs and PDF version. So because it was in Google Docs and um, the license is CC BY, I'm easily able to modify or add or delete to it because it's in a uh, it was shared with me in a Google format. So that was really easy to do. So if that is not the case, if you find a resource that you love, but it's not in uh, an easily um, editable format, you can use uh, remixers. And so if you are remixing multiple OERs in different formats, then you will have to decide which format you want your final product to be and convert the remaining resources to this format for remixing. Okay, so maybe you found um, a lesson, uh, like a module or a chapter, you want to remix that with a worksheet and um, a book. 
And so you want to decide what is going to be my final project. Is it going to be all in a book? Is it going to be a workbook? Is it going to be Canvas modules or um, chapters? So you want to these are things you want to think about as you're thinking about how the final product is going to look. And then, of course, the licensing considerations. So when remixing OER with different licenses, it can be tricky to understand how they can be combined. So, for example, if the resources have licenses with share alike, SA, and non-commercial clauses, you should consult the Creative Commons compatibility information and charts on which licenses are com uh, compatible. So I have a chart for you today that um, re it's really easy to use chart. Um, so I'm going to share that with you in a few slides from now. Um, and then if you remix your OER with different licenses, you need to make clear in your final product, which sections have license restrictions that are different from the one you select for your remix, okay? Even for presentations like these, so if you um, take a look here to the right, I have an image, right? And under the image, I have an attribution. So this image um, is CC BY, um, and but I added the attribution immediately under the um, the image. And then part of this presentation, the five steps to OER adoption, I adopted from a presentation from Com uh, Community College Consortium for, for OER, which also has a CC by license. But I wanted to make it clear that this portion of of what I'm presenting on this slide comes from one section and then what's on the right comes from a different section. Okay, so not only the licensing, but the attributions for the materials that you're going to be using, you might have multiple attributions like I have here on this slide. So we're going to watch a video, um, and this is a nine minute video, but believe me, it's full of great information on creating and combining OER licenses. Okay, so let's watch. With so many new tools and ways to use technology, Open Educational Resources, or OER, have become an important supply from which to draw when developing instructional content. OER are educational materials produced by one party that are licensed to be shared freely and at no cost by others. Let's examine the process of finding and using OER and how to handle the complications that can arise when combining materials with different licenses. There are many open licenses, but Creative Commons licenses are the ones we will be working with here. So how do you go about finding and using OER? Go Let's watch Michelle as she develops a chapter for an open textbook on metabolism. <laughs> Michelle has been teaching metabolism for years. So she has already developed the text of the chapter from her notes, so, but she needs some illustrations, specifically of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. She'd also like to find some exercises to accompany the text. There are many places to find OER, such as Flickr CC, OER Commons, Connections, Internet Archive, or Open Michigan. Michelle goes to Flickr CC at flickr.com slash creative commons. That brings her to a collection of all the Flickr images that have creative commons licenses. She quickly finds the images she's looking for. Both with CC by licenses. For exercises, she logs into the Orange Grove, Florida's digital repository where a wide range of OER are available. Here she searches for electron transport chain and turned up some exercise test questions also licensed CC BY. Because there are no restrictions on these images or exercises, Michelle is free to modify them to suit her needs. 
she resizes and crops the images and writes captions for them. Then for each image, she provides the specific Creative Commons license with a link back to its license deed. Next, she writes the creator's name, linking back to the Flickr site where she found the image. She also adds some references to the images in her text. She then adds the exercises at the end, removes two that did not belong in her chapter, provides attribution to the creator, and links back to the resource. Then she uses the Accessibility Checker utility in Microsoft Word, which spots content that may pose challenges for persons with disabilities. When Michelle saves her book, she notices the metadata text fields at the bottom of the Save As window. Her name is already listed as author. She could add more names if she had co-authors. She enters the title and subject, then several tags that describe the content of her work. When Michelle clicks Save, the metadata is embedded in the document. Finally, she adds a Creative Commons license. Because the other content she is using has CC BY licenses, the least restrictive license available, she is free to choose the license she wants. She goes to the Creative Commons page to choose a license. She answers a few questions and her license is selected automatically. She then fills in some information to help others provide proper attribution for her work and the chooser automatically generates text and code for her document. She copies the text and pastes it onto the first page of her chapter. A job well done, Michelle. Thanks. Michelle used the buy license, which made licensing her new work easy. But not all licenses play well with others. Now, let's consider some situations where the licenses being combined are more restrictive. Suppose you are developing a work and you want to use some other CC licensed works within yours. If you adapt or derive works offered under Creative Commons licenses, you must not only follow the terms of the licenses involved, but also choose a license for your work that is compatible with the licenses of the works you are using. If a license of a work you want to use is not compatible with yours or another work you plan to use, search for a comparable work with a compatible license or try to contact the rights holder and request permission to use the work under your license. New email. So which licenses are compatible and which are not? The BIOS license is compatible with any other Creative Commons license, so you can use it with attribution, of course, any way you like. Sometimes the BIOS license has the no derivatives or ND provision. The ND provision prohibits the works from being adapted, revised, or combined at all. With a share alike or SA provision, your new work must have an identical license as the source content. In other words, this license lets others remix tweak, and build upon a work, as long as they credit the creator and license their derivatives under identical terms. Finally, the non-commercial, or NC, provision makes the license compatible with any of the three licenses with an NC component. By NC itself, by NC SA, or even by NC and D. This is Andrea and Charles. Hi. Hello. They are each developing their own chapters of an open textbook to be licensed separately. That's right. When they have questions about which license to use, they ask Beth, the scholarly communications librarian. Beth is considered the leading expert on campus in Creative Commons licensing. Most people think she's pretty cool. Andrea and Charles would agree. Andrea has found two resources that she wants to use with her own writing. One is an extensive table with useful information for students. The other is a diagram that shows the relationships among complex variables in a way that makes them easier for students to grasp. The table is found in a work with an attribution license. The diagram carries an attribution non-commercial license. She is confident she can use these assets for her open textbook chapter, but she wonders what licenses she can apply to her finished work. Considering the stipulations of the BY-NC license, 
She figures she can use a buy NC, a buy NC SA, or a buy NC and D license. Right, Beth? Great. Now it's Charles's turn. Charles also has two resources that he wants to use with his chapter. One is a photograph with an attribution share alike license, and the other is a set of exercises with an attribution non commercial license. He figures he can cover them both by licensing his chapter with a buy NCSA license. Yes. Beth? No way, Chuck. Not unless you obtain permission from the photographer. Share alike means you have to use the exact same license, and the buy NC license of the exercises won't let you do that. Well, what if I use this resource? Buy license? You're good to go. Thanks, guys. No, no problem. problem. When it comes down to it, some combinations of licenses just aren't compatible, and some combinations, like Andrea's, give several options. Fortunately, the number of resources with open licenses is huge, and it's growing every day. So don't give up if the work you want to use has an incompatible license. There's plenty, and that's it. It's pretty easy when you get the hang of it. Now you'll be able to produce properly licensed open educational resources that could benefit many people. So good luck. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Any questions about OER and combining licenses? I know they went a little quick. Don't fret, I have this great compatibility chart for you. So the way this works is, excuse me, just a moment. Okay, the, great, the way this works is you have the same licenses going across the top from left to right, and then the same licenses uh, on the left from top to bottom. Okay, so if I am combining a public domain with another public domain, then I'm good to go. I can, uh, they are compatible, has a green check mark, and it's okay for me to combine those two resources. <clears throat> now, if I have the same public domain license, but I have the license CC by ND, which has the no derivatives, I cannot remix that, right? So anything with ND, I cannot remix with another resource, okay? So if I go down here and I have a CC by NC, so Creative Commons by attribution, non-commercial, and I want to combine it with a Creative Commons by license, that's absolutely okay, but I cannot combine it with a CC by SA, which is share alike, because remember the share alike license stipulates that I have to use the exact same license for the revised resource. This revised resource is, is, has the NC, the, um, the no, uh, Sorry, the um, the the permission that does not allow you to uh, make a profit. So I cannot combine it with that, right? Because I would have to add this logo to the revision, and I cannot because this uh, license requires that I use this exact same license on the revision. Okay. So um, as you go down the chart, and then you see any black. X, that means I cannot combine those two resources. But if you see a green check mark, then you are good to go. You can combine those two types of licensed resources. Okay, any questions? Okay, so I will be sharing the slides at the end so you'll have access to all these materials. <clears throat> So we are still on uh, step two, modify the OER. So um, 
Another thing you want to think about is the hosting. So now that you have these revised uh, version of OER, you'll want to consider where you're going to house them or where you're going to post them so that students can access a digital copy. So are you gonna post them on your district's website or are you going to post them in an LMS like Canvas? If you are only planning to share on campus, then you might post it in your institution's learning management system like Canvas, okay? So maybe you decide you want to hand out copies to students, but you should still have a digital copy somewhere, whether it's uh, your LMS or your um, school site's website. If you'd like to share more widely, there are OER repositories with platforms uh, that provide authoring tools and hosting to enable public access to your OER. So these are um, these are um, sites like OER Commons, uh, Lib LibreText, Merlot. So a lot of these platforms, you can add your resources and it's free. And they even have the tools and the templates there for you to upload. And it's very, very easy to do. Okay. So now we're going to move on to step three, which is the attribution or giving credit back to the original author, right? So Creative Commons licenses require that the user of the creative work, so downstream users, to attribute the creator or copyright holder. This is also a requirement of US copyright law. So remember, OERs are free, open resources for us to use, but the original author did not give away their copyright. It's copyright plus permissions. So it's a good practice to model the behavior you are trying to promote. Um, so giving credit back to the original author. If you plan to use images, videos, or other Creative Commons license work in your own materials, then you must include the required attribution. Okay, so there are um, many sites, especially the image sites, um, like Pixabay, whenever you download images, so for example, I downloaded this image, and then as I downloaded, it automatically gave me the attribution. So all I have to do is copy this attribution and paste it anywhere, either on the picture, next to the picture, below the picture, above the picture. So it's a ready-made attribution. If the resource that you're downloading does not give you this automatic attribution, then you can use an attribution builder. So I, I uh, wrote an article for OTAN and I created a video for our district as well on how to use uh, the Washington Open Attribution Builder. Okay, so there's a link here to my article on the OTAN website. And this attribution tool is free to use. Very, very easy to use. Um, basically, you need the title, the author, the site, and then the license, and that's it. So all of these um, th four things you'll find at the resource where you um, where you found the resource. So after assessing the open materials and determining the attribution for your OERs, you want to look at the policies and processes at your institution that are involved in the decision making around instructional materials. OK, so that would be maybe your director, your principal, if you have a school librarian, you know, what are the processes and the policies um, to making these instructional materials available to your students. Okay, so you want to be clear about that. And then step four is curriculum approval. So does your institution have a formal curriculum approval process? Okay, so at my district we have curriculum committee and because um, my, my uh, site is part of community college district, we have to go through the chancellor's office for um, approval of 
um, our courses, okay? But approval of our materials is local, right? So um, we can, I can go to my dean, I can go to my department chair, I can go to my textbook committee or my curriculum committee and um, get approvals. Um, you want to consider whether you need to get approval from your institution for instructor, instructional material choices. You want to seek advice from your division or department chair, again, um, curriculum committee, articulation officer, director, or principal. And perhaps you and other colleagues can request a pilot for these new resources and report back the data that includes student and instructor feedback with similar processes as adopting a new publisher book. Okay. And then the last step is the delivery of your OER to students. Okay, so this is step five. So does your institution have uh, a process for distribution of course materials to your students? Okay. Do you have a bookstore or a library, maybe an IT help desk or an on-site print service. Your institution may have a policy requiring faculty to notify the sources of any textbooks required for your course by a certain date. Okay, so if you look, work at an institution like mine, we do have to report. Uh, we have a library, so we have to report to the library and we have a deadline so that the materials are readily available for students before the start of the class. <clears throat> the simplest and most economical method of delivering OERs to students is to provide a link for students to view the OER online or to download it. So most open textbooks are available in a few different uh, downloadable formats, and some of these include PDF, EPUB, or Word. And you want to keep in mind that certain formats may be preferable for students with visual impairments. Okay, so you want to keep all of this in mind with delivery of these resources. Any questions so far? Okay. <laughs> And then, oops, yep, all right, I did click on it. Okay, so um, still on step five, downloadable options may also be useful for students without reliable internet access as they can download the material to their computers, tablets, or mo mobile devices for offline access. So you could also download a copy of the OER and integrated into a learning management system, such as Canvas, Google Classroom, Schoolology, right? There are several. Um, some institutions also use Google Sites as a website or um, an open uh, place where students can access their materials. Um, low cost printing is another option for open textbooks. So printing options could include institutional printing services or students using free printing allowances to print chosen sections of the book. So going back to the cost of OERs, so OERs should be free to students. The only thing you can charge for are printing. Uh, that's the only thing that's allowable. Um, although some institutions, some districts decide not to charge the printing cost, but you cannot make a profit on OERs if the license says you cannot, okay? The only thing you can recoup um, are the printing uh, of those materials if, if you ch choose to do that. Um, so now we're going to look at curating OERs. So how, how am I going to collect them? Where am I going to look for these OERs, where are some great repositories. Um, so ASCCC, which is State California State Academic Senate, has a division called OERI. And they, um, so what has happened in the last couple of years is community colleges have received grant monies, lots and lots of grant monies. Uh, millions of dollars in grant monies 
to produce open educational resources, because that's the wave of the future. That is where our community colleges are going. And so that's kind of trickling down to us and continuing ed and adult education. Um, so because these were um, federal dollars and some federal and some state dollars, these resources are now openly available to everyone, right? Um, so there's a link here for OERs by discipline. Um, here are some examples of what's on the site, but there are more than these. I kind of curated some, uh, some disciplines that we see in adult education, so child development, um, counseling and student success, so like a transition to college course, um, ESL is big, right? Most um, adult education institutions have ESL. Um, there's lots of great materials for ESL. Health education, that's also a big one with CTE. History for some of our GED students. Um, hospitality management, including culinary for CTE. Also IT and CTE. Math for our GED students. And then nutrition. And that could also be part of the health education. Okay, so these are direct links to the site uh, where these uh, resources are housed. But let me show you the large um, ASCCC uh, site. <clears throat> so again, um, it explains a little bit here about um, the, the um, curriculum that was created. Uh, again, this is curriculum that was created for college level, but because the license is an open license, none of these have a no derivatives license. So um, you can revise and remix these resources. So these are all the titles that they have, all the um, titles. Um, and so if you click on any of these links, it will take you to the resources for those um, for those departments. So I'm going to look at English as a second language because that's what I teach. And so they are here. The resources are here. Um, it gives you a direct link to the resource, a little bit of about the uh, resource. This one happens to be a textbook. OK. <clears throat> Um, and so you can go down and take a look. So, for example, this one says Advanced Community College ESL. Well, even though it's an Advanced Community College ESL, I do teach advanced students. Um, so perhaps I could use some of this or part of this or um, get an idea and remix it or revise it, right? Um, so that's transfer level English equivalent. And then there's the next, the level below that, which is transfer level equivalent one below. Okay, so they have their advanced materials at the top, and then the levels start um, getting lower and lower as far as the level of English. Okay, <clears throat> so two levels below transfer, so maybe like an intermediate level for us in adult ed or continuing ed. And then um, here's maybe um, three levels below. And I happen to know these literacy readers, and this could be used in a <clears throat> beginning English class. Um, so same with these here, adult literacy fundamentals. Um, those are great resources for um, our levels. And then here's four or more below the level English equivalent for transfer. Um, so lots and lots of resources. <clears throat> if you want to take a look, now this was created by an adult ed instructor who um, retired from our district. So this is a great resource here. Um, so let me show you. So there are different PDFs, um, different worksheets. Um, it, the delivery here is individual, or you can take a look at the whole book here, or you can use individual the individual worksheets. So I like that um, 
the instructor did that. So if there's something specific that you're looking for in the book, you can go straight to the resource. It's a PDF. You can download it uh, or upload it to your LMS. Okay. So <clears throat> those are worksheets. Like I said, here is um, Kraus is one of the um, authors that I follow. Um, he teaches reading, ESL reading. I teach ESL reading. This is the book I use, his, A Closer Read. It's a great, great book. And he's actually revised it three times. Um, so there's that's a great resource. Um, Timothy Kraus is a great author of resources for ESL. Okay, so let's go back. So that's one resource or one repository of OERs. Um, you can also find resources in Canvas Commons. I particularly um, like Canvas Commons because First of all, we use Canvas at our district, but the resources here, one of the advantages is that you can download the resource straight into your Canvas course. So sometimes you'll find full uh, courses, or maybe you only want to download a module or a chapter or a single lesson. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, sometimes you'll see slides or assessment and quizzes. And again, the benefit of using Canvas Commons is they're downloadable, ready-made materials that will download directly into your Canvas course. Um, in Canvas Commons, you can search by discipline. So um, I teach ESL reading. So in the search, I type ESL reading and it'll bring up a, lots and lots of materials. Um, you, oops, you can also search by author, right? So I've uploaded materials into Canvas Commons. One of my colleagues, Monica Cueva, who's our technology coordinator, she's uploaded quite a bit into um, Canvas Commons. Um, so you can search by our names or any other author name that you know has uploaded into Canvas Commons. Sometimes it's easier to search for things by the author, if you know the author, than by the name of the material, because you might find that uh, ESL grammar worksheet, if you search for that, you might end up with lots and lots of um, resources, but if you know the author's name, um, it's easy easier to find. And then I have a link here on how to import uh, Commons resources in Canvas. Okay, but let's go ahead and go to Canvas Commons, and we're going to search for um, uh, OERs by subject matter, and then we'll also search for my resources and Monica's resources, so you can see what that looks like. So if we go to um, Canvas. <clears throat> I'm going to actually step back a little bit because that took me straight into Canvas Commons. But if you're familiar with using Canvas, once you log in, it'll log you into your dashboard. And then to get to Commons, all you have to do is go to the left global nav navigation bar and click on Commons, and it will open up our Canvas Commons. Okay. So again, there are lots and lots of resources um, and you can just start looking and there's just way too many resources to look this way. So the best way to search is up here in the search bar. So first I'm going to search for ESL reading. And then it's going to give me lots and lots and lots of resources, okay? Some of these are courses. It'll tell you here if it's a course or a module, a page or an assignment or a quiz. So if you're familiar with Canvas, you'll recognize the um, logos here for um, the different types of materials within Canvas. But if this is way too many for you, you can also use the filters here. So you can filter by 
courses or modules, assignments, if you're only looking for assignments or if you're only looking for dis uh, quizzes, discussions, images, audios, video, documents, and pages. And then you could also further filter by content. So whether it's a template or open textbook, the grade level here, and then who it's shared with, okay? <clears throat> so that's um, one way to further filter. So if I'm looking for ESL reading, maybe I'm looking for a module. And so it filtered and it tells me there's 19 results. Oh, there's one of my resources here because I did upload that uh, module. Or if I want to take a look at assignments and modules, or I can remove modules and only look for assignments. Um, so there's a couple assignments on ESL reading there. So it's really nice to have the filter feature there. Uh, like I mentioned, you can also type somebody's name. So if you type my name, Diana Vera Alba, you can um, and press enter. Oops. Huh. Now it's not, oh, because it says assignments. I forgot to remove that filter. Okay, so now that I removed that filter, um, there are three results here. Um, so I have a training course here that I've developed um, and then some extra reading assignments or a module for extra reading that I um, use with my students and I uploaded that to comments. And then here's a OER for um, my our faculty at my district. It's a OVR, OER Canvas account that I created. Um, so we'll take a look at it really quick. And so what I did is I built a repository and a referatory for our faculty. And there are um, several topics. There's OER coordinator resources. So if you have an OER coordinator, librarian, or teacher on special assignment, or someone that is assigned to OERs, these are some um, resources, toolkits, rubrics um, that the coordinator or that person assigned to OERs can use. Um, I do have my um, Creative Commons license up here. So it's attrib the attribute uh, CC by non-commercial share alike. Um, so you can download and use the whole entire um, um, course here or bits and pieces of it. So I have modules, assignments, pages, discussions, quizzes, and lots and lots of files. Um, but I did organize it. Um, so here are um, files on Creative Commons licenses. If you're not real familiar with the types of Creative Commons licenses and what they mean, I have a whole um, page on dedicated to that. And there are videos here as well. Um, here's a section on attributions, a section on finding and using OERs. Um, I have OER office hours for my uh, faculty, so I have done many, many presentations, but here are some that I have uploaded um, for our, for my colleagues, and you are free to uh, peruse. There's also an OER I monthly newsletter filled with lots and lots of um, great resources, so those are there archived for our faculty. And then I have OER repositories by images and artwork. So I have them alphabetized and the starred ones are the ones that I most frequently use because I come, I got, I received that question quite a bit from our faculty is which are your favorites or which are the your go-tos. So I've starred them for our faculty on the ones that I frequently use. The next section is on large repositories. So BC Open Ed is great, especially for adult education. They um, have lots and lots of resources for adult education and continuing education students. Um, I, I need to star that one also. Merlot is a great resource. OER Commons, I really love because it includes an adult ed filter. So you can filter for adult education materials. Um, and then there are open access books. OpenStax has great 
um, K-12 um, topics, but excellent for um, GED or high, high set students. Um, so lots of materials for those types of courses. And then I have OER by discipline. So these are the di disciplines from my district. Um, so there are ZTC and reading resources for child development, some websites and links. And then we also have an emeritus program. So we have art appreciation, brain fitness, ceramics, drama. And then our ESL department is huge. So we have ESL subject conversation, listening and speaking, ESL grammar, multi-subject resources, uh, ESL pronunciation, reading, writing, vocabulary, and vocational ESL. Okay, and there's great materials here for healthcare careers. Um, and then high school diploma, high school equivalency, or basic skills. Um, I have lots of math tutorials, videos, and textbooks. And then the last part are free resources, not necessarily licensed OERs, but nonetheless free resources that are great um, tools for faculty. Okay, so if you search, if you have access to Canvas Commons or Canvas and you search for my name under Canvas uh, common search, you will find this and you are free to use this resource. <clears throat> Monica Cueva um, is one of our ESL instructors who teaches intermediate ESL, and she has great resources um, in, in the commons as well. So um, let's look at hers. She's also our technology coordinator, so she has lots of really high tech um, types of resources. So she has modules and uh, a document here. Our Canvas students uh, use Canvas on their phone. So she created a how to download the app to uh, students' phone. So that might be useful for your students as well if, if you use Canvas. All right, so that was Canvas Commons. Um, I mentioned OER Commons is another great uh, uh, repository. It's a public digital library of open educational resources. You can explore, create, and collaborate with educators around the world to improve curriculum and provide access to free resources for students. Um, so I highly recommend if you have the ability to register uh, um, yourself in one of these repositories. If uh, it's free to register and you can store your OERs there. So as you're searching for OERs, you can flag them and store them in your cloud account in OER Commons. You can also upload your resources to OER Commons. They have an open author um, template, very easy to use. And they have a video on their site on how to use their open author, which basically is how to upload your resources to your OER resources that you wanna share out to OER Commons. And then um, how to build an OER ZTC library. So like I showed you, mine is similar to this. It's, it's an OER zero textbook cost library. Um, so I got ideas on what I wanted in our Canvas course that I, sh that I just showed you. Um, I looked at different college and university OER sites to see how they organized theirs, see the type of materials they had. I use Canvas, so I house the repository and referatories like I showed you in our LMS, but you can, if you don't have access to Canvas, you can also always build a Google site, um, and that's a great resource as well. <clears throat> you can also, um, oops, I think that was the same page, yeah. Um, this was a toolkit that I created to build. Once I had an idea of what I wanted in our um, Canvas Commons site, I kind of 
built out a map of how I wanted to use it. So, um, you know, you can use it in Canvas or you could create a Google site. Um, and then within these sites, you can use um, digital software like Canva to pretty it up, make banners, um, create presentations. It, you can use H5P if you have access to that. Um, H5P is free to adult education now. Um, so that's um, a great resource. And it builds these great um, assessments and um, just pretty ups your Canvas and Google site, makes it prettier. Um, there's also paid software. At my district, we use City Labs. So let me show you what that looks like. So <clears throat> this is the site that I uploaded to Canvas, but because my district uses um, City Labs, I'm able to add these icons. So there's software that will allow you to do that, allow you to add buttons very easily, and um, just make the overall look look a little prettier. Um, so that's available. Um, for a cost, unfortunately, City Labs um, has does have a cost, but Canva is free, and you can do a lots of great things with Canva. So I actually combine both Canva and um, City Labs. So I'll show you an example um, of one of my live courses where um, I created a, a thumb thumbnail using Canva here. So when my students are clicking, they know it's my class because they see my picture. Um, you can also add banners from Canva. And remember, Canva is free for educators. And the Canva, Canva Pro is free for educators. You just have to sign up as a educator. Um, so you can pretty up your course, um, your Canvas course, or your Google site using um, Canva as well. Um, you can use, I created some buttons for students um, so that they don't have to log into Zoom. They can go directly to Zoom from my Canvas uh, page. And I created these buttons in Google Draw, okay? So same with these buttons, I created these in Google Draw. So I kind of use a combination of lots of different um, technology resource and software. Um, I also use Vocaroo for voice. And then this I created, Meet the Teacher, I created in Canva. Not Canvas, but Canva, which is this link here. So I have some direct links for you here for these. Um, design software that will help you pretty up your um, LMS. Oops. <clears throat> um, and then repositories, you want to add relevant resources to your site, lessons, books, OER resources, training modules, visual, uh, videos. Um, so those are repositories. Repositories are when you house the actual materials in your site. And then referatories is when you link out. So you could link out to OER Commons, Merlot, BC Campus, Open Ed, Common Lit. Those are some of the great um, referatories that I like to um, share with my um, campus. And then uh, once you have an idea of what you want, uh, you can create like the resource that I just uh, show, uh, demonstrated in uh, Canvas Commons. Okay, so just remember, search my name and you can download any of those resources if you have access to Canvas. And I do have a CC BY and CSA license. Um, so you can revise and remix that resource. And then um, we're coming to the end of the presentation and I wanted to um, give you some extra resources and links. 
that I used here in the presentation or that I mentioned in the presentation. And I categorized them for you for uh, tools for creating OERs. These are, these are some tools for creating OERs, tools for remixing OERs, and then OER professional development. There's lots of that. There's an OER toolkit here that has pages and pages of links for OERs. Or, or if you have a OER librarian or a resource teacher, this is a great resource for them as well. There are OER image icons and photo sites. Okay, so there are, we were talking about um, accessibility so and um, inclusion. So there are disabled, uh, a disabled in here collection of images that include um, BIPOC and students, so Black, Indigenous, people of color, and people with disabilities. Um, there's also gender spectrum. That's a great collection of stock photos. Um, the NAM project has millions and millions of icons. Um, and I'm not kidding when I'm talking about millions. I believe it's over 3 million now. Pixic Bay is also a great resource for images and Unsplash. Um, here are some videos on how to use attribution builders, Creative Commons licenses, and what are Creative Commons licenses. So I created some of these videos. And then some large OER repositories um, that house great resources. So if you don't want to create it yourself, um, but you want at least some something for your faculty to link out from your website. Um, these are some great um, repositories that house lots and lots of great uh, resources. Now, Internet Archive, I just want to mention, somebody shared this with me. It's a great resource, but they are not necessarily, they are not OERs, actually. Not everything in here is an OER. They do have lots and lots of materials, but recently they got in trouble um, because they were not limiting on what people can upload. They got in trouble for copyright violations. So you want to be careful with sites like that, but they do have some OERs, and that's great. I wanted to share that, but just be aware. You want to search for that. Um, license and make sure that um, you're not violating copyright. Um, here's the video on how to use an attribution builder. It's a six minute video. So um, if you want to start attributing other people's work, I created a video um, there for you to view at your leisure. And so now we're coming to the end of the presentation. I appreciate uh, you sticking around. Um, so to summarize, we went over how to evaluate and adopt op open educational resources. We looked at the five steps to OER adoption, creating and remixing OERs, um, how to combine them, how to attribute other people's work. Um, I demoed some research uh, existing OER sites. I reviewed resources and modules in Canvas. Um, I gave you some directions on how to download those resources into your Canvas shell and some examples of OER repositories and referatories in my resource section. And then I gave you information on how to build a digital OER and ZTC library. Um, thank you so much, Lenore. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here and attending um, this presentation. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.